Well, our thanks as always to Home Street Bank for their support of this podcast. If if you're looking for a bank that has it all, great people, great service, great rates, this is the place for you. This is my letter of choice. It should be yours as well. Go to homestreetbank.com. It's your one-stop shop for all your banking needs, both business and personal. That's homestreetbank.com. What is your selling style? And what do you want it to be? Questions to consider on this episode of The Buyer's Mind. Welcome to The Buyer's Mind, where we take a closer look deep inside your customer's decision-making mechanism to reverse engineer the perfect sales presentation. Now, please welcome your host, Jeff Shore. Well, welcome everyone. Jeff Shore here, host of The Buyer's Mind, the podcast where we try and figure out exactly what happens in the psychology of a purchase decision. And our take on this is if you understand the way that your customer wants to buy, then you can reverse engineer your sales presentation in order to make it easy for them to do just that. And it is our job as sales professionals, isn't it? To make it easy for people to buy. And today I want to look at the question of style. How do you sell? And how do your customers want you to sell? How would you describe your selling approach? I mean, just think about it for a moment. Have you ever considered that? Have you ever stopped and thought, well, what is my style? How would I describe that to someone? And I'm joined, as always, by our show producer, Paul Murphy. Hey, hey Murph, describe your style, even in the area of audio-video production. I, I like to uh, tell friendly stories. Mm. So uh, I think of myself as a storyteller, yeah. and I think what's the friendliest way to share that story? I love that. Great answer. Okay, so now let me put you on the spot. How would you describe, Murph, the style of Shore Consulting? Because we're a sales organization, right? We, we've, we have that work to do. So how do you describe the style of Shore Consulting? We're nice people, and we want to work with nice people, but we're also driven people, and we want to work with driven people. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a blend of experience and powerful results. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's right. We we do, uh, we are nice people. We want to work with nice people, as you say. We're driven. We want to work with driven people. But the question is, how do we make sure? And I think that this is a good word for all salespeople. We want the results, but we also want that great experience, and we can blend that all into our style. I, I think style is not something that we give a lot of time thinking about, but I would say it's really important to our customers. And I think that's where we begin. What does your customer want from you? And our guest today, and we'll get to this here shortly, uh, has made his mark with his own unique style. Jeffrey Gittimer is brash, bullish, and brilliant. I don't want to put words in Jeffrey's mouth, but I think he would say that the world has too many people who just won't say what really needs to be said. And Jeffrey Gittimer tells it like it is, as you will soon see. So, what about you? What is your style? And that kind of leads us to our quote of the day from uh, Paul Harris. He says, personality has power to uplift, power to depress, power to curse, power to bless. I just love that. That style, that personality is everything. And if you add a second aspect of style in this quote from Linda Ellerby, styles change, style doesn't. So what are you doing to ensure that your style is right for both you and your customer? And with that said, let me give you your sales tip of the day. And it is to do this, to interview your past best customers. Talk to the people with whom you have a great relationship and who will openly answer and ask them the questions. What do you appreciate about great salespeople? And what turns you off about bad salespeople? And use their responses to be self evaluative. Ask yourself the question How am I doing on this? Now, be careful. You don't want to just listen for what you're doing right. You want to listen for the areas that you can improve upon. So go out, talk to your past best customers and ask them what they are looking for in order for you to be able to define and describe your own style. Hey, one last thing before we get to the interview with uh, Jeffrey Gittimer. You may not agree with everything Jeffrey says, and you know what he would say about that? Great! Think for yourself. 
look, I've known Jeffrey Gittimer for a lot of years, and I can tell you this. He is brash. He is opinionated, but he wants you to think for yourself. He wants you to challenge what he says. And, and, and I just want to encourage you as you listen to this. It's a really, really interesting interview. And it's going to challenge you. It's going to challenge the way you think. It's going to challenge some of your paradigms. Good. Let that happen. We always want to have that idea where we're not so uh, stuck on our own ideas that we're not willing to listen to what some really, really smart people have to say. All right. Well, this is going to be fun. Uh, we have on the line with us uh, the one and only Jeffrey Kittimer, author of 13 books, uh, all uh, best bestsellers, uh, the, the Sales Bible, the, the Little Gold Book of Yes Attitude, his most successful title, the, the Little Red Book of Selling, sold more than 5 million copies worldwide, translated into 14 languages. Basically, everything he writes is a bestseller. He's also the host of the wildly successful podcast, Sell or Die. Uh, his approach is unique. His energy is powerful. Palpable. His authority is unquestioned. And if you were planning to listen to this podcast as background noise, you should probably think again. Uh, please welcome the one and only Jeffrey Gedimer. Mr. Gedimer, how are you doing today, sir? Thank you, Jeff, for setting such low expectations. <laughs> um, but it's a pleasure. Uh, you're out in California, right? I am in California, in very rainy California today, but uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, let me get my violin out. I know, exactly, the, exactly. One of the most interesting things I find about California is the roads are full. Yes. All the time, in both directions. There's an elevated spot on the 405 when you're headed down towards San Diego or headed up towards Los Angeles. Right. Where you see nothing but headlights and taillights for miles. Now you just you just called it the 405. That was a very SoCal thing of you to do, right there. Right. It all highways are named the. <laughs> not not a, not in uh, NorCal. We we separate ourselves from those guys. Uh, so, oh, you don't call it the five? No, we don't. We don't. It's just five. Uh, you know, wait a minute. What, what do you call? It? What do you when you're going from San Francisco to, uh, let's say, Lake Tahoe? Yeah. You have to go through um, Sacramento or something. Don't you call it the 80? And then as you keep going through Auburn, that's where I live, and we just call it heaven. That's that's what we call it. We just call it oh, heaven. Oh, my. So there you go. There you oh, go. cool. <laughs> well, the produce is good, but the uh, <laughs> that's about it. Uh, you were born in Florida. You're living in Charlotte. Nothing on your Wikipedia page mentions any time that you spent in the greater New York City area where, I, if I'm not mistaken, your sales career kind of began. Take us back to those early days. Yeah, I uh, I grew up in the suburbs of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. I went to Temple University. And my first uh, manufacturing factory was in Camden, New Jersey, where I made leisure furniture, otherwise known as beanbag chairs. And I sold in <laughs> Manhattan. I would go to New York City and dump a bag on some furniture buyer's desk and ask him how many he wanted. That was mm -hmm. my whole pitch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, although if I went to a big store like Bloomingdale's, I would get the furniture buyer on a cold call, dump the furry bean bag, the big furry bean bag, in, and I, I would say to the buyer, have you ever sat in one of these? And he goes, no. I said, well, why don't you sit in it and, you know. So the guy would get up from his desk, sit down in the chair, he goes, wow, these are comfortable. I would hand him a purchase order and I'd go, just fill it out. And he would. So, so this was just part of your DNA from the very beginning. This is just the the way that you thought early on. I cold called anybody that I wanted to make a sale to. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'd get the door slammed in my face. And even if I did, I would knock again. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to have fun in sales no matter what I did. Yeah. And then I, I was in the imprint of sports tour business in, in Florida, and I would make all my calls in Manhattan. So I literally grew up cutting sales teeth in New York City. Yeah. And that's a boy, when they say no, they say no with a vengeance in New York City. And guess oh, what? Yeah. You, you never got shot. You probably never got spit upon. You you lived to, to. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I got cursed at. Right, right. Um, you know. Uh, I'll I'll make it G-rated. Up right. yours is a greeting in New York City. Um, my fiance, my girlfriend Jennifer Gluckow, and I we actually had lived in the city for the past three years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, half time New York City, half time Charlotte, because I, we have so much business there that I just wanted to kind of be present and have a good feeling about waking up in the morning and getting an actual bagel that you could eat. Sure. Yep. Uh, yep. And. I still carry my Metro card. We moved back to Charlotte uh, this past year mm -hmm. because it was just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, a two-bedroom apartment in Manhattan was going to cost us $7,500 a month. Yeah. 
and up yours. <laughs> and if you want a parking space, it's six hundred dollars extra. Right, right. But you get it. But but you get a good bagel. You get a good bagel. You got that going on. Exactly. So now I can go. For, it's cheaper for me to go to New York City, stay at a five star a five star hotel, and yeah. have my bagel delivered. That's that's right. Exactly. Your your style is is uh, bold, brash, uh, brazen. Were, were were you always like that as a little kid? Because I I have to tell you, I see you. I see you someone spending a lot of time practicing penmanship by writing phrases to start with the words "I will not" on a chalkboard over and over again. Yeah, no, I didn't have that. Uh, I got lucky. Uh, my parents were very, um, I don't know, culture oriented. Mm-hmm. So they would buy tickets for Broadway shows. Mm. And if you lived in Philly, they used to open in Philadelphia and then move to Broadway. Hmm. So my parents always had these tickets that we would go to. Sometimes you go to Broadway, but most of the time in Philly. And I went to this show called The Miracle Worker, which yeah. was the story of Helen Keller. Sure. It starred Patty Duke mm-hmm. and Anne Bancroft, I think. Uh-huh. And it's so intensely emotional and everyone was crying as they were leaving the theater and I bump into my eighth grade teacher in English and she was my homeroom teacher and the teacher and I was still in the eighth grade. I got an A for the rest of the year and I didn't do shit. (laughs) Um, So it wasn't that I I will not or I, I, I wasn't a bad kid. I was just a smart kid. Right. And my parents were smart, therefore I was smart. Mm-hmm. And I always figured out a way. I figured out a way in college. I figured out, you know, I, I made money in college. And I had to drop out because I wasn't making enough money. Yeah. Yeah. And it wasn't really doing me any good. I didn't really, you know, college is a great thing for discipline or playing Jeopardy or uh, Trivial Pursuit. It's real good for that. But I couldn't, you know, unless you're going to be a doctor or a lawyer or something, it's not a gross necessity. You can pretty much learn on your own. Yeah. And these days you can learn a hell of a lot faster and a hell of a lot more. Yeah. And you don't have somebody droning on about what their political view is. Yeah. That's why I love so I, uh, I looked at I looked at it from the perspective of I was going to make my own money uh-huh. and college was holding me back. You know, it's interesting because you look at great salespeople and they're like that, aren't they? They're they they they're that the calm, cool, quick problem solver. They're 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 the type that can look at something and just go, well, just do this, right? And and it's just like, oh yeah, why didn't I think of that? And I I think it's one of the hallmarks of great salespeople. I just went out and made friends, mm-hmm. and the more friends I made, the more sales I made, the the more money I was able to earn. Yeah. Yeah, and that's how I looked at it. I'm, I I can go back to any customer I've ever had and call them on the phone and talk to them. Yeah, most of them I have their cell phone. Yeah. So so when you're out there today and you're working with sales teams, what what are some of the things that drive you a little nuts when, when you see you know maybe it's just the way that they were trained or the habits that they formed, but what are what are some of the things that just drive you up the wall? Well, the biggest thing is that all sales managers want, or all sales vice presidents or sales leaders Mm -hmm. want their salespeople to be on a team. Mm -hmm. And salespeople do not want to be on a team. They want the guy next to them to die so they can either have his territory or his book of business. (laughs) If uh, Bob dies, can I have his, uh, you know, leads, you know, that's, that's literally, that is the paradox of a sales team. Now, there are teams in the sales world, but they are internal teams and vertical teams. Mm -hmm. So you may be selling building supplies, for example. You have an accounting person, a credit person, you have a warehouse person, you have uh, maybe an inside service person and a salesperson. Mm -hmm. That's it, Mm -hmm. that's the team. Not the guy sitting next to you you're not on his team. You you want to win the president's club and you want him to lose. Correct? Well, listen, I, 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 I'm not sure that I, I'm i entirely with you, Jeffrey. I, I, I understand what you're saying. you're in saying. California. You want everybody to be equal and stupid. <laughs> now, easy there. Easy there, East Coast guy. Uh, I, I totally understand. There is a, uh, I, it, when people ask me what's the number one trait of a great salesperson, I always, always respond the same way, and that is achievement drive. Great salespeople have to win. So, I totally get that. Uh, I do think that, right. there, that there are They're environments. They want to win. They want the other guy to lose, so he'll look better. No, but wait a minute. Why can't you do both? Why can't you win and help your teammates to win as well? Because I'm not in the business of helping other salespeople win for their account. I'm going to win one. I'm not going to win one for the Gipper. 
I'm going to win one for my mortgage payment, my kids' private school tuition, a, a vacation, and a car. Listen to me very carefully. I'm not going. To, my boss is going to come to me and say, "Can you train Bob? He's a new guy, and I want you. I want him to ride along with you." No, I'm not going to do that. Right. Unless you want to pay me another five thousand bucks. Right. And I'll train Bob. Totally agree with you there. There should be some compensation uh, in that situation if, if we're going to ask somebody to do that. Right. So why would I want to help this other guy make a sale? Why would I want to spend an hour of my time that I could be calling five other customers rather than focus on Bob who got a stumbling block because somebody said his price was too high? I, I don't want to get into this idea here or, or get you thinking that I'm into this as a communist state. That's that's not the way that I see it at all. Uh, no, I'm just it's looking, not communist. It's just yeah. socialist. <laughs> or socialist. Uh, I'm looking at it from the perspective of uh, just the abundance mentality, that there, if there are enough sales to go around uh, and, and you're doing your job, it's okay to want your, your peers, your teammates to be successful okay. as well. Okay, let's look at it another way. Suppose there's not enough sales to go around, uh -huh. yeah. which there haven't been for the last 15 years. Uh, at that point, the, the strongest survive. They, it, we live in an it's evolutionary every, society. I, it used to be, the phrase used to be, it's every man for himself, but yeah. you're not allowed to say that anymore. Yeah. So it's every person for themselves. <laughs> And and it, and there is no prize for second place in selling. Yeah, no, I I, I I totally Blue. agree with you. I totally agree with that. So my podcast is called Sell or Die. Right. The the mug that we have says there's no second there's no prize for second place in sales. Right. You know what do you get? You, you get fired. Right. Yeah. No. We've there's no question. There's no tomorrow if if they meet a better closer on the way home uh, today. Uh, th okay. So let's let's look at it as a, on a B to C basis. Let's say yeah. I'm selling a. A house, sure. and somebody calls up and they want their home listed. Yeah, am I going to give it to Bob because he hasn't had a listing in a while, or am I going to keep the listing? Yeah, uh, of course you're going to take that answer. I'm going to keep the listing. Sure. Okay, sure. let's say I'm selling a car, and my up walks in. Am I going to say, "Oh, you know, Bob, you haven't had enough sales to this month. I'm going to give you my up." There's no way. There's no way. There is no way. Okay, but if the newbie comes along and says, "Hey, listen, I, I want to get better. Uh, I, I, you know, can I? Can you? Can you offer me some pointers? You don't think a good guy's no. going to come along and help him? No, I'm not going to do that. And the reason I'm not going to do it is because my boss is so weak and so stupid that he's going to let somebody on the team work with the new kid. If you want to make me the chief learning officer in the company or the chief sales guy to help other people, mm -hmm. give me another twenty-five grand a year. I'm a happy guy to do it. No disagreement there. Let's talk about the customer sure. and what the customer has gone through. Uh, apart from the sheer volume of information available today that they didn't have, say, uh, 15 years ago, uh, do, do you think the mm -hmm. customer has changed, or is the customer f uh, fundamentally the same as they have, have always been? The customer is so much smarter right now mm -hmm. than any salesperson. It's scary. Mm -hmm. When you, if you're going to buy a car, and maybe you have bought a car in the last year or two, mm -hmm. you do online research right. for 10 brands, and you know exactly what you want and exactly how much it costs. Yeah. All that information is available on Mother Google. Mm -hmm. So you walk in with a piece of paper, and the paper tells you exactly what to say and exactly what to do. And the car salesperson, like an idiot, comes up to you, smells like a cigarette, right. is drinking a cup of coffee, and says, uh, what brings you in today? Do you right. have a new, you wanna purchase a new car today? Do you wanna lease or buy today? Do you have a budget today? Do you have a trade-in today? If it wasn't for the word today, they couldn't even talk. Mm -hmm. And then they wonder why the customer wouldn't take yes for an answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know, they, they, they use the same old drawn out stupid ass tactics and think it's gonna win. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, boy, uh, no disagreement there. It, it drives me nuts that the process has not evolved uh, uh, to match the way that that customers uh, really, really right. want to buy. It's 100 years old yeah. and needs to change with the economy. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So how do you do it? It needs to change with Mother Google and the Internet. So give us one example of how a salesperson changes with the economy in, in this day when the salesperson, or I'm sorry, when the customer is so much more educated than they've ever been before. Let's take the car sales guy. Sure. The customer walks in and he or she pretty much knows what kind of car they want. Isn't that true? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Mr. Jones or Mrs. Jones or Mr. and Mrs. Jones, I'm really glad you're here today. Most people who come in are looking for some specific car. Would that be you? And they go, yeah. 
I said, well, let's pick out any one you want and let's go take it for a drive so you make sure it's the one that's right for you. Mm-hmm. Why do I need to go through how many engines it's got or how many right. horsepower it's got or where the radio is? I don't care about yeah. that. I already know all that. Mm-hmm. I've already done all that research. I already know exactly what I want in that car. And I, and, and I would, as a salesperson, I would say, did you happen to bring a piece of paper with you or did you memorize it? Because most people who come to a car dealership right now have a piece of paper. Mm-hmm. And that paper tells that guy everything. And why would I want to look like an idiot by going through the same hieroglyphics that I went through 20 years ago before the internet would allow me that information? Yeah. On the on the drive mm-hmm. with them, I'm going to ask them how they use the car right now. Mm-hmm. I'm going to inform them that the car is going to probably need service, so we meet, we might want to talk to somebody about what that looks like. And then when I'm done, the car is going to have a resale value. And do you want the one that has the best resale value? Now I'm a consultant, not a car sales guy. Mm-hmm. And if I ask any question, I'm going to say, "Have you thought about?" Right. That's what. I, that's how I would help a car sales guy. And I've helped car sales people, and it's kind of fun to do when you're talking to the consumer. Now they're smart people. They are unbelievably smart people. Well, listen, they're smart people, but they still want to make a heavily emotional decision, right? You're buying a car, you want of to course. smell it, you want to, and yet that—that's what drives me nuts. It, when the salesperson wants to get into this, you know, here's the statistics and the logic and the analytical part of it, and they're actually robbing the customer from the opportunity to do what they really want to do, which is just that's simply exactly falling off. Yeah. The sales made emotionally and then justified logically. Yeah, yeah. That yeah, there's there's no question okay, about so it. Okay, so I. I uh, let me throw this at you. Sure. Um, let's say I'm in the real estate business. Yeah. And I walk into a, a new home development, mm-hmm. and I meet the salesperson there. Hi, welcome to uh, Gittimer Estates. Mm-hmm. Um, can I help you? Uh, I believe my line is, I'm just looking. <laughs> no, I'm here for my hair transplant. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm looking for a house. Yeah, great. What's the first question they ask you? Uh, it's typically going to be how many bedrooms you're looking for. Nope. Uh, this is my space. That's what they ask. So how many bedrooms? Tell me what you're looking for. Nope. It's, it's... They ask, do you have a house for sale? Yeah, on the resale side, you're more likely they to hear that. To but qual- yeah, yeah. I hear They it. try I hear to qualify it. that buyer mm-hmm. in a heartbeat. Mm-hmm. That's not it. Ha- Asking me if I have a home or if I have a mortgage or if I've ever been late for my mortgage payment, that, right. that's not helping me. Right, exactly. You know, it's interesting. I was just in Charlotte a few weeks ago and I was moderating uh, for a client of mine a group of prospects. These were not people who had purchased. These were all people who were thinking about buying a home. And I was working mm-hmm. with a home builder, a regional home builder. You would know the name if you're in Charlotte. And and uh, one of the mm-hmm. one of the the uh, the, the panelists there, uh, she just she she stopped talking to me, the moderator, turned to all of the executives and said would you just take an interest in my life? Would you stop asking me about how many bedrooms I'm looking for and and, and whether right. I'm working with a right. realtor? Would you just take an interest right. in my life? And and it was an impassioned plea. It was actually uh, quite stirring, and I, I suspect that she's the voice for a lot of people these days. Yeah, I, I'm either going to ask an emotional question or I'm not going to ask anything. And the most interesting part to me, and I've had a lot of experience at this, so... I'm a real estate owner here in Charlotte. Yeah. I I buy, I actively buy in my building. Mm-hmm. I have a condominium building and I'll, if you're next to me, I'll buy the one next to you. Mm-hmm. And sometimes the real estate salesperson is a really nice person, sometimes they're a jerk. But but it, this is the this is the challenge. They walk in as an informant, not as an information gatherer that makes an emotional decision. Yeah, right. Yeah. So they'll walk into a bedroom the guy says, this is a walk-in closet. Really, you can just like walk in, or what, then what happens? No, you turn to the woman and say, will all of your clothing fit in this closet? Right, yeah. Because if it won't, they're out. Yeah, right. And you can end the tour right there. Yeah, this is something that I, I, I love to say. Uh, it, I don't care what the product is, but I don't care if you're selling a home or a car or diamonds or whatever it is. Uh, that, that, that presentation is not about the home or the car or the diamonds. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. 100% about the person you're talking to. And if you get that wrong, your presentation is doomed right from the very start. And, and, I, and I, I totally, I totally agree. D- w- w- that whole idea of this is a walk-in closet. It's like, what kind of moron could not 
figure out that this is a closet that you can actually walk into. But I think we say these things all the time because we think that the presentation is about the product and not the customer, and that's where we where we get into trouble. I would have to say this, Jeff. Sure. There's a lot of morons out there. <laughs> but it's how you earn a living, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we'll, we'll always be if employed. If everybody knew everything, you'd be, you'd be broke. <laughs> how do you respond when you see the salespeople just turn the corner and become just flat cynical? They they start saying, you know, buyers are liars, and uh, you know they 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 moan and they complain about their own customers. I simply ask questions. Mm -hmm. I'll ask, like, what's the last book you've read on positive attitude? Mm -hmm. I'll ask, what's the what's the last seminar that you went to on on professional selling skills? Mm -hmm. I'll ask when a customer walks in, how do you engage them? You know, I I want to I want to know. If people are cynical, it's usually because they're doing it the wrong way. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it was a bad lead. No, it was not a bad lead. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything that I would define as a bad lead. There's always someone that you know, and how you treat them is going to determine your fate, because they may live next door to a billionaire. Yeah. And in today's world, the word of mouth travels a hell of a lot faster than word of mouth. And you're looking for ratings. You know, every if I, when I check out of a hotel, the first thing they ask me is, "Will you put us? Will you give us a rating on TripAdvisor?" Mm -hmm. That's what drives the business in these days, and that's why the world has changed. The world of retail sales, especially any B two C business, that that has changed forever. You know, I, I go into a business and they say, "Please like us on Facebook." I'm like, seriously. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go home and go, honey, do we do we remember to like them? Why don't they have a computer right there where you can log on and like them? Right. Uh, there's, there's another side of that, and that says, why don't you do a good enough job that would cause me to want to do yeah, that on my, to on my own? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, but I'll tell you that that's what drives the business now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. And those algorithms change now, like, weekly. Yes. So you have to look at it, not just from a standpoint of what are you doing? Like the algorithm for Instagram just changed and I can't see what people really like of mine. Yeah, yeah. Because they show my ads before they show my, my pictures. It's like, it drives me nuts. But it, it does explain why we love going back to the same salesperson over and over again when we when when they've gained our trust when we know good. we can depend on them. Uh, exactly. We, we'll, exactly. We, we'll we might have found a be slightly better product or a slightly better price somewhere else, but we'll give up on that in a heartbeat in order to work with somebody we really like and trust. Yep. All right. Listen, um, I, I totally agree with that. We're, we're almost out of time, and I, I want to respect your time here, but I, I, I want to do this real quick. Here, just some rapid fire. Okay. Quick questions, quick answers. You ready? Yeah. Okay. When you were 12, you thought you would be what? Lawyer. Uh, a, a book that you read early in your life that made a strong impression on you? Think and Grow Rich. Mm. Uh, the most beautiful place you've ever stood? Whoa. Uh, the Matterhorns. Switzerland. Mm, love it. If you could attend only one concert, who would you see? Electric Light Orchestra. Uh, <laughs> uh, your last meal on death I'm row. Friend, I'm friends with them, so I, oh, I'm well, there friends you go. with them. So there I you go. go in the dressing room when it's over. Love it, love it, love it. Uh, your, your last meal on death row. Uh, I would probably have brisket that I made with uh, potatoes and carrots and onions with horseradish for the brisket. And uh, I probably would have a Coca-Cola that night instead of uh, seltzer water. <laughs> the name of your first celebrity crush? Wowie. I think it was Shelley Long. <laughs> I can get behind that. I can get behind that. All right. Yeah. Uh, fun stuff. Fun stuff. Uh, la last question. Um, it might have been Bridget Bardot. Let me go back. It sure. was Bridget Bardot. Was it? That's for sure. Was it? Okay. All right. All yeah, right. Bridget Bardot. Yeah. I, I, I can't. No argument there. Uh, last question. It's, no. It's it's. <laughs> yeah, we're we're gonna move far into the future. I don't know how far. Many decades into the future at your retirement party. If everybody that spoke at your retirement party wanted to sum up your career in in one sentence, what what, what are you hoping that they would say about Jeffrey Gittimer? Irreverently funny and brash. I think you're on the right track. I think you're on the right track. I'm having a good time at it. Listen. Jeff, if I wasn't having a good time, I wouldn't do it. I have a great time. I make people laugh. Mm -hmm. I create atmospheres where they want to buy, and I'm, you know, I get to do what I want to do. I yeah. wake up in the morning and I'm happy. Yeah, yeah, it's a good life. It's a good life. I'm a family guy. Mm -hmm. I should tell you that from the outset. Yeah. My, I have a family business, and I'm a family guy. Yeah, I involve my my kids in the business. My my 
fiance is in the business and I treat everyone here as though they were my son and daughter. Awesome. Love it. There he is, uh, the one and only uh, Jeffrey Gittimer. You can go to Gittimer, G-I-T-O-M-E-R.com, and you're going to see everything. You're going to see a ton of books. His online courses are amazing. You can follow him on all kinds of social media. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast, Sell or Die. J- trust me, just listen or watch one episode of Sell or Die. You will be hooked. Uh, it's one of my favorite podcasts. Uh, it, it, it's it's all at Gittimer.com, G- G-I-T-O-M-E-R.com. I'll put that in the show notes uh, as well. Uh, Jeffrey Gittimer, cannot thank you enough. That was big fun. It's a doggone pleasure, sure. Uh, so there you go, uh, Murph. That was that was quite a ride, wasn't it? It is. You know, anytime you talk to somebody from the East Coast, you're going to get uh, get that good attitude. I love that attitude. Yeah. Yeah, this, uh, you know what? He, uh, and here's here's the thing about Gittimer. Uh, he, he, he could be described this way: the man gets letters. Right. The man's going to get some letters. He's going to get some blowback. He's going to get some pushback. But you know what? I, I seem to think that that's exactly what's going to happen when you are genuinely authentic. We, we may not agree with people all of the time, or we may find them brash or whatever, but the reality is we just don't see authenticity uh, as much as we probably want to. It's kind of refreshing, even if sometimes it, 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 it tweaks you a little bit, right? Yeah, well, and you know, he shared some wisdom that I've actually shared with some people, and it's not very popular. And that is, college is not for everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And basically, you can go without a college education and have a great career. College is something that rounds you out as a human being, makes you a little bit yeah. smarter, makes you a little more educated to talk about topics, but it doesn't necessarily help you in the long run. Uh, unless, like he said, you're going to be a doctor or a lawyer or something like that, right. and that's not a right. popular concept. Yeah, yeah, we're still it's 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 still we're still fighting uh, the idea that if you don't go to college, you, you sort of did something wrong, and I, I think we're evolving on that uh, right now. But I'm 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 with you. Uh, I I did I do certainly appreciate the idea too that uh, and and I'm, this is really for everybody who's listening right now. Uh, you know, here get in our and I get into it right from the very beginning over the idea of that driven salesperson and whether my win means that I want you to lose, right? And you heard that debate, you heard that discussion, and and I, I, obviously we could have gone on and on and on. I wanted to get into other things, so I think you heard the way that I sort of maneuvered out of that. But I think the key is this, uh, that it's okay, and we have permission to say, how do we think for ourselves? How do we hold to our position? How do we hear what other people have to say, respect that, and then move on from it? And and uh, you know, I, I, I if, look. If we all thought the same way, then somebody would not be thinking, right? We're we're just uh, parroting other people's thoughts. So I actually enjoyed that banter right there, and and I think Jeffrey did too. And, and th- then the one thing that I really want to uh, hit on here was as he was talking about how the customer has changed and how the customer is so well informed they are so smart and to a large degree they know what they want and so I want to challenge you the listener right now to ask how much has your sales presentation changed to match the new reality of our customers because the customer already is so well educated so are you just trying to tell them things that they already know like this is the steering wheel this is the kitchen they can figure these things out already uh, are, are you helping them on the emotional journey that they want to go on? Or are you giving them facts and figures and a bunch of logic and, and, and analytical stuff? That's not where their head is at. How much has your presentation changed to match the way that your buyer wants to buy? That's been the theme of the Buyer's Mind podcast since we started. If you know your customer well enough, you can reverse engineer your presentation in order to make it easy for your customer to buy. That is what we do. And I just would want to challenge you to just try this one thing. Just spend a little time on this. I've got an assignment for you right now. I want you to pretend like you are a car buyer or an expensive jewelry buyer or a a life insurance buyer or a a home buyer, whatever it is. Just pick a product. doesn't matter. You're just going to go into your imagination. And I want you to ask the question, if you were really serious about this and you had already done your research online, then what would you want from the salesperson? What would the perfect salesperson look like in that environment? Now, once you figure that out, 
Go be that salesperson. Sell the way your customer wants to buy. It's a beautiful partnership when it goes right. We're helping our customer to do what they really want to do. We're helping them to change the world. Well, once again, my thanks to Jeffrey Gittermer for being on the show today. My thanks to all of you. And boy, I'll tell you what, if you haven't left a review on iTunes, we would so much appreciate you doing that. Just go over to iTunes, uh, type in The Buyer's Mind or Jeff Shore under, under podcasts. Either one will bring up The Buyer's Mind podcast and then leave us a review. We really appreciate it. And that actually helps us to grow our reach. It helps us to grow our, our numbers. So, uh, it would mean so much to me if you would leave a review on uh iTunes. But until next time, go out there, my friends, and change someone's world. Mm-hmm.